I'm Christopher Ahmad, and this is a technique that demonstrates medial ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction using the docking technique. I'd like to thank Ian Byram and Chris Voris who helped with this demonstration. So the docking technique is one of several techniques to reconstruct the ulnar collateral ligament, and the graft choice can either be the palmaris longus graft, which is taken from the forearm of the wrist, typically the ipsilateral side, or the other choice that's popular is the gracilis tendon graft, especially if the palmaris longus is absent. The gracilis is often more robust, a sturdier graft, and can be used in such cases as revision surgery. Here the patient is positioned. Both the leg and the arm are prepped and draped. This patient did not have a palmaris longus graft, so the gracilis tendon will be harvested. Non-sterile tourniquets are both placed on the upper extremity and the lower extremity. We choose to use the ipsilateral lower leg for the graft harvest. The proximal anterior medial tibia is palpated approximately three, three finger breadths from the joint line. An incision is made over the palpable semitendinosus and gracilis tendons. An incision made in the skin, and then the adipose tissue is dissected free. The sartorial fascia is identified and then incised in an L-shaped fashion. This is then reflected and controlled with a clamp allowing dissection of the gracilis tendon. Here a right angle clamp is separating the gracilis tendon from the sartorial fascia and then it's sharply incised. Now with control of the gracilis tendon with a clamp the tendon can be sutured with a number one non-absorbable suture. Once control is obtained of the graft then more extensive dissection with release of the soft tissue attachments can be performed. The suturing is then completed in a whip stitch fashion and then blunt dissection is used to make sure that all soft tissue is freed of the tendon. A tendon stripper is then used to release the tendon at the musculotendinous junction. Here gentle steady traction is performed while advancing the tendon stripper allowing release of the tendon. The tendon is then brought on the back table and the muscle is removed. And then the tendon is placed in a moist sponge. Next, an approach to the medial elbow is employed with approximately six centimeters curved directly over the medial epicondyle. Dissection is carried down to the adipose tissue. Here, musculocutaneous branches are identified of nerves during this dissection with care taken to cauterize vessels and identify the, the nerve branches. Often the branches of the musculocutaneous nerve are running just anterior and distal to the medial epicondyle. In this particular patient, however, the musculocutaneous branches are identified posterior to the medial epicondyle. They can be protected by dissecting the nerve free, mobilizing it, and here you see a vessel loop is used to gain greater control of the nerve. Next, the intermuscular septum is identified. A small incision is made posterior to the intermuscular septum. Just deep to this tissue is the ulnar nerve. Careful dissection is performed here, and this is going to allow access to the epicondyle, just posterior to the epicondyle. The intermuscular septum is then slightly divided, and a more extensive neurolysis is performed. This will allow retraction of the ulnar nerve posteriorly so that a tunnel for the exit strategy and the docking technique can be employed. Here an incision is made for the anterior exit tunnel over the pronator fascia and this will allow for exit tunnel creation. Next an incision is going to be made in the raffe over the flexor carpi ulnaris. Sharp dissection is used to create the incision in the raffe. And then blunt dissection is going to be performed to split the muscle. This muscle splitting approach is in an internervous plane between the ulnar nerve and the median nerve. And then here, sharper dissection with an elevator can be performed, and the posterior aspect of this dissection is the ulnar nerve, and care is taken to mobilize and protect the ulnar nerve. Next, the native ulnar collateral ligament is outlined with a marker, and then an incision is made sharply from the sublime tubercle directly to its attachment onto the medial epicondyle. 
the ligament is then assessed for injury, either intrasubstance or attachment site injuries. Here you can see it's detached distally and with valgus stress there's opening of the ulnar humeral joint indicating insufficiency. Converging bone tunnels are then created with a 3.5 millimeter drill. The bone tunnels are then connected with a curette and care is taken to ensure that at least 8 millimeters of bone bridge is achieved to avoid fracture. After connecting with the curette, there's a chamfer tool that can be used to take the sharp edge off of the bone, which will create less injury to the graft once the graft is passed. Next, a suture passing device. This is a malleable wire can be passed across the bone tunnel, and through this device, sutures can be placed, and this is a loop suture that will then be used later for graft passing. Sutures can also be used to test the integrity of the bone bridge by applying slight traction across the bone tunnels. Next, the first tunnel on the medial epicondyle is created at the anatomic insertion of the ulnar collateral ligament. This is at the inferior and also anterior aspect of the medial epicondyle. This is a 4-5 drill and it's created unicortically. Attempts are made to obtain a distance of 1.5 millimeters or greater without perforating the far cortex. Next, two exit tunnels are created. Here's the more posterior of the superior exit tunnels with the ulnar nerve protected, and here's the more anterior created through the pronator fascia. This connects with the inferior tunnel, and then the malleable suture passing device is placed across the tunnel configuration, and a loop suture can be then placed for later graft shuttling. Similarly, this is performed for the posterior exit tunnel. And here, two suture shuttles are achieved. Next, the graft is passed first from anterior to posterior. Care is taken to avoid excessive traction on the graft that could injure the bone bridge. Once the graft is passed, then the native ligament is repaired. This is with a zero or number one non-absorbable suture. Multiple interrupted sutures can be placed or a single suture in a running fashion to repair the native ligament. Next, the posterior limb of the graft is passed through the epicondyle by shuttling the graft suture the suture is tensioned, delivering the graft into the epicondyle. Next, the graft is tensioned, varus stress is applied to reduce the ulnar humeral joint, and the anterior graft limb is marked for accurate tunnel placement and graft tensioning. That graft limb is then controlled with the number one non-absorbable suture placed in a running whip stip fashion. The excess graft is excised, and then the graft limbs are docked into the medial epicondyle by applying tension on both graft limbs. With tension on the graft limbs, the elbow can be cycled to eliminate any creep. And then the elbow is positioned in approximately 60 degrees of flexion, supination, and the graft sutures are tied over the epicondylar bone bridge. Next, the graft is inspected, and multiple sutures can then be placed in the graft limbs themselves, or the graft limbs can remain as more of an anterior and posterior construct. But here we elected to suture the graft limbs together with zero non-absorbable suture. The fascia is then closed with running absorbable 2-0 suture. And here the fascia is repaired. And then the skin is closed routinely. Sterile dressings are applied and the patient's placed in a splint.